Can you tell me about choosing the title? You mean Jobs opposed to Why Not Steve Jobs? Or also where you have the lowercase J. Well, that doesn't happen now, though. There's yeah. No lowercase I J. saw that disappeared. We disappeared the lowercase J. First of all, the lowercase J, I, to be honest, I think somebody just did it as a lark on the script just because it was kind of like goofy. And they just picked it up, but it was never going to be the font for the title of the movie. It was like almost an in-joke. And it got just sort of put on like cruise sheets and then it eventually got into the media and I, at some point I said why is this everywhere what happened because we were this is pre-production you know it was kind of a lark and now it was never going to be the design of the movie so. everyone took it very seriously they took it very serious but you know that's the thing about this movie which we did not anticipate was the amount of interest just the general interest it's like putting a pebble into a into a, a lake and the ripple effects of every move from casting to everything became a talking point throughout the world which was interesting and what was it like for you taking this on before you even boarded the project were you a big apple fan i was a uh, i had owned apple products but i kind of it was nice because i sort of took them for granted you know i had an iphone i had a mac i had i mean i had had them since the first since i had a, an apple you know, classic, and I had that huge bag that came with it. Um, but I never was obsessed with Steve himself, and I think that was important that I, the director, was almost removed from it so that he could see that this was a movie about a man and a character. Regardless of the fact that he was an icon, I had to find the drama and I had to find the arc of the character. So I had a, a nice sort of distance from him as a, as a sort of being invested in him personally. So I think that was important. And now how about your viewers? Because there's going to be any average moviegoer that goes see that goes and see this movie, but there's also going to be those Apple diehards. And personally, as someone who kind of straddles both sides, yes. I've I can view the movie almost in two very distinct ways. Did that cross your mind at Tell all? Tell me your distinct this together? ways. What do you mean? Define well, your distinct for, ways. First is like just any any moviegoer watching a story right. about this man with this incredible arc. Yes. But then also I I'm very firmly addicted to my Apple products, so I also see it as this like juicy source of information and history well, that yeah. I never knew. Here's the thing, is that in the course of his life there was so much we had to leave out. And I think different people have something separately invested in him. So, you know, I didn't do a whole scene about the fact that he went to Xerox and he got his sort of user interface uh, from Xerox. And, you know, we didn't add the bit about the fact that Microsoft, you know, when Apple was going under, invested $100 million. I mean, there's a lot of details for the people who are sort of Mac obsessed and Apple obsessed that we didn't put in there. But to me, this was just a movie about a man and his company and how at some point the company became the man and the man became the company. People say, is this a movie about Steve Jobs or is this a movie about Apple? And I think that you, they're inextricably linked. I don't think you could remove them. And that's so, I mean, maybe there's so few people that you can say that about in our history. Maybe Ford, you know, Disney per, per, per chance. But in the end, that's what this movie was about, and I had to keep that focus. And in keeping that focus, was there ever a time where you had to maybe fight for a certain tidbit of information in that history to include, or maybe had to reluctantly remove something? I did, you know, there was a lot we couldn't talk about just because we just don't know very much about it. I mean, there's, you know, he was fiercely private, he was a true enigma, you know, the, what, what his personal relationships were are under lock and key. I don't think it'll be years before the wife, Lorene, ever mentions it or anybody in his world. So we were left with what is known and what his co-workers knew, which is, to be honest, not very much personally. So from that, I hope that the accumulation of the movie gives you a sense, doesn't answer all the questions, but gives you a, a feeling for the man, a sense for the man. Um, and, you know, there were things that we shot that we didn't, didn't make it into the movie, a couple of things that were just, just didn't work, but they were just interesting tidbits about him, like, he used to try to relax himself. He used to sit on a toilet and he used to f put his feet in the cold water and just flush the toilet and f just like he was like relaxing to him. And we had we kind of shot that scene, but it never made it into the movie. It just didn't work. But you know, there were some things like the fact also that he used to cry a lot. You know, that's a sort of documented fact. And we did a little bit of it, but that was so difficult to translate. Like, how does someone just break into tears when you say? You know, your you know your dinner reservations were canceled because he supposedly did cry at a sort of drop of a hat. So we just had to pick and choose. And how was it picking Ashton to play that role? Because 
I mean, just sitting in the press conference, I can see why you did choose him. But at the same time, you know, this is this isn't just a character that someone made up. This is a real person, and he is a very recognizable celebrity. If, now, I'm so glad he's doing these press conferences because if you hear him speak, all right. So now, put yourself in my shoes. You walk into a meeting. You have a guy who can talk about everything there is to know about the tech world. Everything there is to know is about Steve Jobs. Passionate about him. It's important for him. And oh, by the way. He looks exactly like him. So you tell me what else, what, 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 what was I to do? I mean, you know, so put a prosthetic on a different actor who doesn't know anything about Steve Jobs. I mean, it would have been, so, I mean, so for me it was obvious. Um, and I'm really glad that Ashton is out here talking and, you know, really having this discourse so that people really see that side of him that they may not know. And can you tell me a little bit about putting together his look and demeanor? Was everything kind of straightforward? You had to do what you had to do? Or was there any trial and error with certain features? The, the, I think both of us sort of studied Steve Ashton religiously. And so what was known was Steve's idiosyncrasies. He had his big loping walk. He used his hands a lot. When he was younger, he used his hands a lot more wildly. He played with his hair a lot. You know, obviously he had a lot of hair at that time, and he did, you know, and he gesticulated a lot. And all those movements came down to kind of here when he got a little bit older and did a lot of, you know, a lot of like this and a lot of intensity. So we worked out what's the arc of his movement. So a lot of it was more about tempering it. You know, because on film and during certain, on with certain lenses, it was just looked a little too cartoony. Because the real Steve Jobs, you know, just from what we could tell in all a lot of the video that we had of him, especially the young video, was I mean, there's p pictures of him. Is where you know he's like all over the place. Like he's like, I, 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 you know. So <laughs> he just it's you know, funny how you like can only we, do so we much all of it. almost <laughs> do his movements now. What? What? We all almost do his movements with yeah. all of our touchscreen products. Also, we do him. He we makes, all have a little he bit He makes us. us do this now. He like, he like, that's so true. I never thought of that. Wow. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Can you tell me about some of your visual choices, too? Was there any, you know, certain standard towards, towards your visuals that carried through from beginning to end, or maybe certain things that you put in different portions of his life to differentiate them? So, um, visuals as in? As in, like, your shot selection. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good question because you're asking a director question, which I love. Uh, yeah, I mean, the beginning of the movie is all long lens, lots of flares, lots of him in nature, lots of him among a lot of people, him in India, him in the college campus, him like within people, him finding himself, lots of movement. And then when he steps into the second part of his life, which is when he created Apple, and he was in the business part, which he never left, windowless, you know, fluorescent, big wide lenses, he starts to become more isolated in the frame So he, because he's separate from people. He's in big spaces but alone, which is sort of the, sort of the symptom of being sort of a visionary. You become more and more isolated as you get older. And then at the end, when he has his resurrection, he's fired and comes back, it becomes a much richer, not so, de not so desaturated, flares come kind of creep back in, windows blow out, there's more kind of a... Um, these are subtle things you wouldn't That's notice. one of my favorite shots in the film, though, where he's walking across the hall, and it's like that orange in the background. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of that very subtle stuff, but, you know, I had didn't have very much money to make the film, and I got Russell Carpenter, who did Titanic, he's a DP. He's just a brilliant DP, and we worked so hard at, we every day, every shot was talked about, and, and then when we got to the set, we sort of let it go, and, you know, as a director, when I first got the film, I did that natural thing, which is, how tricky can I get? Should I have a Steve Jobs cam? Like, what's he like when he's in a, in, like, in a meeting? Do, 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 does everyone else disappear, and, and we only see what Steve Jobs is seeing, and is he, like, on a beach somewhere? But the reality was, is, no, I just sort of thought, you just had to stay out of the way of it. Just, like, let it play, especially for the first film about Steve Jobs. Just, I thought you just needed to let it play. And just to narrow it down, one random shot that just sticks out in my mind, when you have the big office meeting and Waz is just standing there off to the side of the frame and you have a big video game yeah. taken up the middle of the frame. Can you tell me the thought behind that specifically? Well, it's great that you brought that up. You know, first of all, Waz, they put a, they put a couple of those standing old video games for Waz. That was, part of, that was just a little bit of a thing if you know about Waz. That, that is a bit of a... Um, you know, fun to, to look at. But, you know, Waz was sort of like the fool in King Lear or like Jiminy Cricket. He kind of 
was sort of the conscience of Steve. He was the other side of Steve. Without Steve, there would be no, without Waz and Steve together, there'd be no Apple, really. And they kind of completed each other. One was a techno technological sort of impetus, the other was the salesman of it. And then at some point, Steve sort of took it and made it into what it was. And, and our perception was that Waz sort of was there for me in the movie just as a reminder of it and as an observer at one point. And the scene you're talking about is when he brought Scully in and, you know, it was, um, it was about the fact that he got the guy who did the Pepsi commercials to sort of, you know, and he knew that this guy would, would be, a, he's a businessman, he's not what Steve was going to want him to be, that he'd eventually probably, you know, betray him, which he did. And so for me it was about Every, well, everybody else was clapping as Steve started to think that he, this is how he should battle the corporation by trying to bring these corporate people in who we thought were on his side. And so at that moment, Waz sort of turns around and goes into the video game, which to me represented the fact that he was still in that youthful, fun spirit of how they began, and Steve was just floating away on an ice you know, float. So that was what it was all about. Would you ever consider making another chapter to this story? Because there's still so much left to be told about Steve Jobs. Well, they're going to. <laughs> no, I mean, there's already the Sony film, which I'm sure will be brilliant. I mean, there's going to be so many films about Steve Jobs. I would. I'm fascinated with Waz. Um, I think the end of Steve's life is just just in and of itself a Shakespearean play. His whole life is Shakespearean. And when I say Shakespearean, I just mean it has sort of epic, classic, almost mythological, you know, narrative structure if you study literature. I mean, everything from the fact that he was, you know, given up at adoption to, to, to two sort of blue-collar families that he was raised, but he loved them and loved him, but he always felt he was bigger and smarter than his environment. He met a scrappy group of smelly guys who were like in the forest to me, that's like Robin Hood, who kind of just tried to revolutionize. He got into the palace, he got finally was there, but wasn't ever seen as legitimate, and finally there was all this palace intrigue of all his friends stabbed him in the back, and he was, he was cast out, and he was banished, and he was, and then he comes back after having sort of experienced life, and he takes over in the end, resurrected. I mean, you know, that's really what happens. So for a, for a, dra a dramatist, that those are the hallmarks of a good story, and you couldn't have asked for his life to have been a better sort of, you know, guide and, you know, falling into a better structure than that. Did you use any Apple products in the making of this movie? And I don't mean on screen. I mean, like, to make the movie. Um, we did not use Final Cut Pro. We used Avid. Uh, we did not use any uh, Apple products. And, in fact, uh, no, not to actually film or to edit the film, but... I will say one thing that I haven't ever mentioned before. Our, my biggest issue with this film, my biggest issue was that we were shooting a film in 19, the late 70s, early 80s, and the biggest issue we had in post was the amount of iPhones in actors' front pockets that were walking through that we had to, we had to like soften in digitally effect sometimes because it was just so obvious that this, this was in their pocket, you know, and so, and that familiar buzzing that the, that the, that, and that familiar beep, beep, the little funny little sound through all our sound, so Steve was there inadvertently through everything. <laughs>